Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Bartlett, and I'm the Director of Enrollment here at Proctor Academy, coming at you live from beautiful downtown Andover, New Hampshire. There's a full 18 inches of snow on the ground. We're expecting another six to eight later this week. Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you for so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're really excited to be able to uh, spend some time with all of you prospective uh, families and maybe even some students out there. And uh, the goal for tonight is number one, to celebrate February 1st, because today was the application deadline. Actually, you have till midnight tonight if you wanna submit anything else, but hopefully you guys are all good to go. Uh, we're super excited, great applicant pool this year. Um, and just to let you know, we are recording tonight's event. We will post it uh, later on for if you missed any of this. Uh, so um, anyway, so we are here to uh, spend some time with Brian Thomas, who is our head of school here at Proctor. Uh, Brian is a relative newcomer to, uh, to Proctor Academy, having started uh, just th last July. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be on the search committee. Uh, so we had a giant long runway to uh, figure out who our next head of school was gonna be. And uh, we found the right, the right person. So we're really excited. Uh, Brian's done a great job of sort of getting to know the community and integrating himself really quickly with the student body. Um, but that's my perspective. And what I really wanna do tonight is, um, give all of you an opportunity as prospective um, families and students to get to meet Brian because um, many of you who have been on campus have met him. Uh, others uh, have only known Proctor by, by Zoom. Uh, so we thought this would be a great opportunity just to uh, sort of have a more intimate conversation with Brian, uh, get to know him. And so what I will do to, to start out with is just ask Brian maybe to, um, to tell us a little bit about his journey to Proctor. And I'm just gonna share a, uh, just a quick, a quick slide here of, of Brian, so he can, uh, he can introduce himself. So thank you, Brian. Hey friends, how are you? Um, a lot of, Chris, you so much thunder. Thank you very much for being here, everybody. That's the first thing. And for those of you who are like deep in, the application process, maybe you haven't even submitted the button yet. Thank you very much. Uh, you got some work to do. But most, most importantly, uh, I just want to welcome everybody here tonight. Um, this is my eighth month in the chair. But as you know, with head searches, it's really almost a two year process. When I first discovered the job uh, online to really being here today, it's been about um, been about two years, maybe it's three years right now, actually, because uh, it was right before the pandemic started. So um, really quick sketch, some of it you've seen right there. Um, I most recently have come from the Midwest um, at MICDS, which is Mary Institute in St. Louis Country Day School. I was the assistant head there. Um, and most of my career, 32 years actually in schools has been either as administrator, a teacher, I'm an English teacher, um, and coach. So fitting right back into the Proctor world, the Proctor vicinity, it was, it was pretty smooth because that's sort of what people do. They wear multiple hats. They do many, many things. They coach, they're in dorms, and they teach. Um, other things that they do might be uh, even run activities. So that's been uh, part of my, um, really part of my career started out actually teaching on sets of TV and movies. Um, and that's a pretty interesting thing. So I get what kids who are really working at a high, high level uh, have done, or even some kids who struggle. Um, and I've been in Los Angeles, started my career in the Bay Area, San Francisco, um, Marin Academy, um, Presidio Hill School, Bentley School, started a school for Andre Agassi, the tennis player, and uh, the high school. And um, most recently, as I said, was in the, the Midwest. A couple of accomplishments that I just wanna tell you a, a little bit about is what I'm most proud of is the ability to be in um, environments and really focus double down on community. And being at Proctor, I found that really like in double, triple, quadruple, we are a heart connected, uh, affective connections. Um, 
and really strong relational kind of place. That was the thing that really most drew me. I'm also an educator too. So um, looking at the variety of things that we have in our program, both the academic program, as well as the co-curricular, extracurricular programs was something that drew me here uh, as well. And if somebody had told me when I was a 14 year old that, um, that I, there was a school like Proctor that it existed, I probably wouldn't have believed them. And in fact, I remember my mother telling me the story about, hey, you know, there's this uh, school, it's a private school, it's in our area, it's like Father Mendel, I think that's what it was called, it was from the Chicago area, would you like to go there? Um, and I told her no, um, because, yeah, largely because it wasn't, that school doesn't exist anymore, by the way, uh, I don't think, it, it was not Proctor. So if they had told me about Proctor, I don't know if I would have believed them. I would have had to have seen it for myself. And, um, and still, I would have thought maybe it's not quite real just because of the things that our kids get to do. And um, it, I'm, I'm really happy to be in this seat, in this chair uh, at this time. There have been three other heads over the last 50 years. That's the kind of stability that I wanted. It's been a great board, uh, amazing students and parents. Uh, just had uh, dinner with, tonight was, of course, Chinese New Year. Uh, our sort of Asian, East Asian students cooked dinner for us tonight, which was pretty amazing. Um, they were very, very proud of that. Um, but if somebody had said that this school existed, I don't know if, um, if, if that would have been anywhere sort of in my consciousness or in my radar, but it does exist. What we're here to do is to answer any questions about what it is that we do. Um, we are not really trying to sell you, but to exactly tell you what we do, uh, which we're, which we're proud, pretty proud of. Um, um, and more than anything, the thing that I'm most proud of of this place is how authentically it is what it is, so. Awesome. That's it. That's sort of my two to three minute drill. Um, I think I've marched us all the way down to the field, maybe a field goal, um, but I'm going to open it up to questions at this point. At this, right. I, I watched a little football this weekend uh, at this time. So I'm hoping that you're well. Great. So Brian, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, take your, your pretty face off the screen and uh, stop sharing. And what I'm going to do is um, just invite folks to, um, to use the, the Q and A, the chat, and you can just throw questions in there for Brian. I will kind of aggregate them and moderate a little bit. Um, and so, you know, what we what we said for this event was like anything's fair game. Uh, so, you know, Brian's he's pretty good on his feet. Uh, I, I'd like to see him tested personally, but. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but anyway, so because we can certainly uh, you know we've got plenty of things to talk about. But we want to know what you're interested in knowing, and um, and so feel free to throw some uh, throw some questions in there. First question, I love this one. Uh, you, you you grew up in Chicago, Brian. What part, and how did you end up at Yale? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, I my dad lived in the city of Chicago. Uh, my mom and I we all lived in Robbins, and then moved to Harvey, Illinois. So if you know anything about Robbins, Robbins is almost like um, it's like the Mississippi Delta, uh, but in the north, um, it was probably one of the poorest uh, cities, uh, villages in the in the country in the north. Uh, and Harvey was this very industrial, um, north, uh, you know, northern city. And how I ended up there is I had amazing teachers, and this is one of the reasons why I'm at Proctor, who really pushed hard, had very high expectations for me, but most importantly, knew exactly who they were dealing with. Right, somebody very verbal, um, you know, interested in a lot of different kinds of things, but they were able to channel that energy over time. Uh, was interested in theater, so this was the time. I think Meryl Streep had just graduated from the Yale School of Drama. I had no idea that the Yale School of Drama and the Yale College were any different. They they were, they are. Um, the uh, Geffen School at the Yale School of Drama, or something like that. I can't remember what it is now, but. Uh, in my class with Jody Foster, a couple of classes below was uh, Jen Beal. Uh, I became a professional actor actually after college for a little bit. 
decorated, um, acted in Chicago, off-Broadway, and then in LA was uh, on the uh, show called A Different World uh, for a little bit. But I made a transition out of it, um, really thinking about my Chicago roots just because I, I wanted something more in my life. And that was, that was schools. Anything else, Brian, about like, how about the, just like the journey from, you know, Chicago to, to going to, to Yale? College? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was How did that happen? Um, I did everything in, in high school. I was in band. I did a lot of theater. Uh, I was in student government. I took law classes. I had this teacher who was a uh, uh, used to teach law, but he was a lawyer. I think his name is Alan Jones. Um, people noted that um, there was this kid south side of Chicago, not a lot of opportunities, um, who I would just do everything, and that everything really landed in one or two buckets mostly student government leadership. And then the other was, was acting. That was my ticket in. Uh, and I never in my time at my high school, did I make the main stage? We, we had like this 1500 seat theater. Uh, was I ever like a lead role in any of the main stage shows? Was always sort of the second character. First play uh, at Yale, I didn't even know what to do with myself. I became, I was the lead in the, in the, in the play. Um, that was how good I think the training was when I was uh, in high school. And like most sort of inner city kids, you never know like how good your, you know, your training was. It was lacking in some areas, but, but that was not one area. Cool. All right. So Brian, shifting gears a little bit. Uh, let's talk about the here and the now. Let's talk about the winter, the adjustment to small town, New Hampshire, going from you know, the West Coast to St. Louis now to New England, like how's, how's it going? How's small town, how's small town New England treating you? Um, I stand out. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I mean, okay. Um, when I walk into JJ's, which is our town sort of, uh, it's sort of our town center. It's a gas station across the street. Uh, most of our kids go and have breakfast. The, the amazing uh, breakfast, breakfast sandwiches there. Um, I, I feel seen, uh, not in a bad way, in a really, really good way. Uh, Jen Braley, who owns JJ's, um, and her family has been in this town for, for years, uh, and everybody else here has made, they, they've made me feel so welcomed. Um, my family, when they're here, uh, they spend a lot of time on the West Coast. Um, they have felt really tremendously welcomed from the Proctor community. Uh, there was a reception in the very beginning to come meet the new uh, Proctor head of school. And that was that was pretty neat just because I got a chance to see um, there are a lot of accomplished people who have lived and settled and retired in places like ours. So you would run into, you know, your dentist and he's got like 14 degrees or something like that. Um, my, the woman who assists me in my, my work, uh, Angela, her parents run the country store in Danbury. And I, I went up to see them, uncles, um, very well-educated, very knowledgeable folks. Um, it's not what most people, it's not what I, I thought it was going to be. And not, you know, um, I didn't think there would be a rude awakening, but it's interesting to be, at a, at a school like this in the country, basically, and have your community both ready-made, but also people around who, uh, we are the largest employer in town uh, in, in this area, um, who really are rooting for us uh, to be successful, rooting for me to be successful. And that's kind of cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, I think, you know, the, if, I, if I'm to read the sort of theme of a couple of questions here, Brian, it's, it's probably what we anticipated, which is, you know, what, why Proctor? Like, what, what, uh, what pulled you here? I mean, you could have gone to all sorts of different places. Uh, you could have been in the West Coast. You could have stayed in the Midwest. You could have been at other schools in the East. You could have been at day schools, you know, but why did you pick us? Um. Somebody told me that they didn't think I would come, <laughs> which is which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, uh, 
Uh, you know, there's that line, I think, in, in Beloved, uh, where uh, Paul D, for those of you, I'm, I'm, I'm an English guy, so forgive me. When Paul D says to Setha, like, you are your own best thing, you are your best thing, right? Um, I don't think people have said that to Proctor enough, that it is its own best thing, right? This school is kind of, a, it doesn't exist anywhere else. I mean, I know I've been some. I've been in some great schools around the country, day schools, all of them. Um, a lot on the West Coast, a lot in places that are really desirable. My family goes back and forth between the West Coast, the San Francisco Bay Area. They live in Marin County. Um, I live in Marin County, I guess, too, by <laughs> by example. But I'm mostly here, uh, all always here. Um, the thing that's really very interesting is that this model just doesn't exist. And in fact, when I track back my career, I've tried to make, without thinking about Proctor, without really knowing Proctor before a couple of years ago, I'd really have tried to make every school I've been a part of this school. The academic support, uh, the experiential education, the 24-7-ness of it, um, the kind people, the amazing kids, the supportive adults, the supportive faculty, every single school I realized, I tried to make into Proctor. And, um, and it only exists, I think, in this one place. And it sounds like, oh, like Field of Dreams-esque, I'm a baseball fan. Uh, but it's, it really is a, an amazing sort of amalgam of places that, um, you know, the, the, we're in, you know, we do care about sort of college placement, but we also care really about the the soul that's really thinking about herself, himself, their their self uh, in this place at this time. And that's hard to find. There are very few places that aren't trying to think about tomorrow or next year or four years from now. Um, that's not the school you will find. We are trying to find the best school um, and match that with the human that is really in the school uh, at that time. And to put it simply is we are teaching the kids that we have as opposed to the kids that we want. Hope that didn't sound wrong. <laughs> right? no. we, want, we want your kids, but we really are loving on the kids that we have. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Um, so, Brian, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, maybe some community moments for you where you've sort of seen the best of Proctor, um, and not to put you on the spot, but, uh, you know, moments this maybe this year or even before this year when you sort of could see the heart of Proctor, right? Because you sort of, you, you talked about that a little bit. Um, yeah. The, the heart-centeredness of the school and... Uh, can you sort of think about or give an example of when that might have transpired for you? I mean, when our international, even today, like in our international students ran today's assembly, which was really on the Lunar New Year. And so kids who, who spoke um, Vietnamese and uh, Mandarin um, uh, and sort of other dialects got up to really talk about sort of why the importance of Lunar New Year to them. Seeing our kids take the reins in any way, whether it's on the ski hill or in the theater or in the classroom is, are, are the moments that I love the most. Uh, there was another moment in the, during, I don't know if you remember this, Chris, but um, <laughs> it was 725. It was between the second and third period of the boys hockey game. It was their first home hockey game. Uh, we had delayed some of them. And 725, all of the kids disappeared because it was study hall. And I was like, what is going on here? Where's everybody going? Um, and they said, well, Brian, we got to get back to study hall. I'm like, um, no, <laughs> let's make sure that we, it was my, it was my only sort of powerful thing, maybe my last powerful thing as head of school. I just said, we got it. I, I probably went around to like three or four people do, do, can they come back? And they did. The other team sort of tied it up because the energy had deflated from the rink. Um, but our, our team won in overtime and it, and I think they won because of the, their 
their buddies were in the gym with them or in the rink with them. Um, it was the most amazing thing that I've seen, just sort of that relational aspect of, of um, we're all here to support you. And that's what it felt like today in the international school visit. That's what it feels like when I go to, and I visit classrooms. Uh, any place in and around that Proctor is, it feels like this massive support system. Brian, some kids did twist your arm about can't, uh, study hall that they night. A couple did. kids. Let's just be honest here. <laughs> I, but I could have said no, right? We could have right? said, I, I was the one who was like, where are they, where are they going? <laughs> what the heck is happening here? Uh, Good news, kids. Was, Brian doesn't know what study hall is. So this is a, <laughs> it's going to be a great four years at Proctor. Head of school doesn't know what study hall is. Um, I do because I, I actually go myself. I go to study hall at the, in the library, which is happening in eight minutes. It's true. <laughs> it is true. Brian actually does go to study hall. It's weird. Like Every you go night. into the library and it's like, <laughs> who's that kid over there? And it's Brian. He's in one of those cubicles and he's just doing his work. I am. It's, it's like a Jedi mind trick on the student body. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of where's Waldo, it's where's Brian. He's there he is, popping there. up everywhere, right? <laughs> so Brian, this is not on the, the list of questions, but this okay. is uh, this is my question. Uh, okay. So like, what do you think about boarding school, right? I mean, it's such a different, it's such a different beast, right? In some ways. And uh, like, I'm actually curious, like, what, what do you think? I mean, <laughs> um. It's, um, it's different, you know, like what I've talked to a couple of uh, parents and not on this call, I don't think, but they say, and I've seen it like in person myself, that when their kids come home to, to them, they get the best version of that kid. Like they make their bed, they don't have to tell them twice to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, but when I see them here, and one of the things that I love about, um, boarding school is, you know, we don't, you know, we call them dorm parents and we kind of mean that like in the, in, in local parenthesis of version. So in place of parents where you can see an adult having a really hard question, you know, sort of pointed conversation with a kid about uh, what they could be doing or better choices they could be making or the kind of choices they are making. So I'll cruise around in, in the night on my bike, uh, in the cold, um, to just sort of watch that in, in some ways. It's the thing that you cannot capture on video or, I mean, we, we have some of the best, I think, communications output, just read any of the stuff. That's one thing that is very, very hard to capture is the moment um, that, you know, a, a, you know, a kid in a dorm, um, sometimes tears, you know, sometimes a, a kid, uh, there was a kid who, who uh, just a couple of weeks ago lost his uh, stepdad and the dorm parent was was right there. Uh, it was a kid that I knew even before here and he he cried on my shoulder as well. Um, he went home a little earlier for um, for break, but it, it's really nice to know that there are adults like that around for your kid when things do get tough. Um, but it's also nice, and here's the other bit, um, to have the best version of your kid come home to you. That's a good pitch for boarding school right there. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> I, I wish I could rewind the clock, man. <laughs> Maybe I'll just send them as 26 and 24 year olds. <laughs> a little too old, Brian. They could be dorm parents though. Would be weird. I know they could be or surrogates, right? They would be surrogates. Good surrogates. Exactly. Surrogate. exactly. So, um, Brian, in your opinion, uh, like, what do you think the characteristics of a really great Proctor kid are? I and mean, what do you, when you think about the best version of, of what <laughs> kids are doing and who they are, like, what does that, what does that kind of look like to you? Well, first of all, it's, it's sort of like that. What's the portrait of a graduate? <laughs> you yeah. know, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Aren't, aren't you graduating like 90 kids or something like that every, every year? I think the best version of a Proctor student is um, that they know themselves better, not so much about where they're going to go to college, um, not so much about what they're going to do after college, um, not how much money they're going to make, um, but they know themselves really, really well. You know, they, they have spent time on a solo in mountain classroom. 
right? They came in during doing uh, wilderness orientation. So they've spent some time with each other um, sort of out, really out in the open. Um, they have been on a tall ship someplace. They've traveled over to, to Europe. Uh, they've been in a classroom with kids who've really begun to challenge their, their thinking and, and adults too. Um, I think that our students know themselves better than any of the other kids that I know. Um, they're fiercely loyal to the place in a, in a way that's uh, a little um, a little different, uh, I think. Cultish? <laughs> no, no. Well, yeah. No, not cultish. No. Okay. Um, but, but in a but really in a way that's um, uh, that's different because they can they can come out really disagreeing. I was at a I was at an alumni event uh, when we launched uh, the the fall ocean classroom. And there are all of these alums from various pockets of time who were living sort of in, in, uh, in, in around the Boston area. Um, but they were wildly different from each other, but um, fiercely um, clear about the school. Um, and they were interested certainly in what the new head of school was going to talk about a little bit. But they were really interested, not just in me, but in e each other. Uh, in ways and and how they were supporting each other, they they were. I just the the kindness, the the ability to understand each other, the ability to 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 get help from people, like not to be afraid to ask for for help. That's you know that's one of those things where you know kids that go sometimes to to the big name brand schools really don't want to do. Um, and um, there's a lot of giving, I think, that that goes with that. So, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Do you need a sip of water or anything? Are you good? Me? Yeah. Of course, I didn't bring water. <laughs> like, probably, like a good Proctor student, right? Um, <laughs> would not have water. I thought I had water in here. I have no. I think there's water in the back, but it's been there probably for three months. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's not, let's not touch that. that. Let's not. Touch I won't that. drink that at all. So. Um, you knew this question was coming. And uh, so any big goals, plans, what are you thinking about for the future? Or what are we thinking about? Well, it's interesting. We're, we're launching a strategic planning and master planning process uh, over the next little bit. <clears throat> and um, I, I sort of think the, the thing that I told the folks when I came in was, you know, during this really deep period of listening that we have, that the thing that I was mostly interested in was amplifying what we already have. And, um, and certainly there's some things, you know, I would, I would love um, to look closely at the student spaces and the faculty spaces, but that's just sort of an, an enabling exercise, right, on the way to something greater. Um, one thing that's really of interest to me is, um, you know, for, for those of you who are looking at sort of the critical race theory debates that's raging, uh, we've got a ship that is off the coast of sort of Florida, Georgia right now. It's our students, 14 of them, uh, nine students from the Met, which is a charter school, largely African-American. Um, most, most of the kids actually on this version of our uh, voyage uh, are white. And they are taking a tall ship around the coast, um, sort of open waters, but then around the coast of Florida, and they're going to land. They launch from Charleston. They're going to land in Mobile, Alabama, at the site of the very last slave ship that came to America, the Clotilda. Um, Zora Neale Hurston did a um, sort of a monograph, 1927. She interviewed one of the last people uh, who was on that ship, this guy named Cujo. And uh, the name, the title of the, the book is, is called uh, Barracoon. And our kids are going to be there. They'll, they'll be the first, you know, sort of students, humans that, are, that have been there. This, they just located the ship maybe two or three years ago. Now, going back to the idea about, you know, how do you study sort of the sort of American experience? That's the American experience. Right, 
we're 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 not getting into or being sucked into debates. We're we're actually touching it. They will be the boat will be above the wreckage of the Clotilda. Uh, read up on it. I won't bore you with its history. Um, but I'm going to go down with the woman who's the basically my uh, version. Uh, you know, she's the head of school of the Met, uh, and we're going to meet those kids down there and really talk about what happened. They were launched by someone who whose great great grandfather um, was uh, an enslaved man who escaped during the sort of opening days of the of the Civil War, and they're going to conclude. At, for the last slave ship. And you would think, oh, that's 1808. That's when sort of slavery ended. No, that boat sank in 1863. Um, so our kids are sort of understanding that part of our history. Plus they're sail sailing a tall ship. They're learning how to be with each other. They're learning how to live in community. Um, they're learning how to think really critically for themselves uh, as opposed to telling people um, or, or yeah, he, hearing it in a textbook someplace. So cool. Um, I want to do more of that. You want to do that's a vision. That's the vision. Just having our, what we're experiencing really live into, um, the, the real lived experience of our students. That's the vision is, uh, is doing more of that. And so that's the amplification, right? Like right. you're taking an existing, something that existed at Proctor and sort of amplifying it, right? Yes. And that's probably where the sip of water would have come in to hydrate my dendrites so that I could have, <laughs> I would have been able to, <laughs> forgive me folks, um, would have been able really to put push that all together. Uh, but yeah, that's who we are as a school. We're just we are, we're giving kids transformational experiences wherever they may be in and around campus. We're not going to put every kid on a tall ship uh, because she or he or they may not really want that. But one of the things that they want to do, may want to do, is to test themselves to their limits uh, with trusting adults around. And that is what we do. And that's what we do really well. Hmm. Yeah. That's the vision. That is the vision. That's actually well put. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> That's good. Um, so let's see. Um, next question. Oh, uh, fundraising. Ah, yeah, we yeah. do it. We are we going to do it? Yeah, we do. Uh, we're you know. Um, can I do the the? Do you mind if I do the um, golden ticket thing? No, go for it. Okay. So what I would love, and somebody says, is that need blind? No. I want every single kid at Proctor, and most of them do, to feel like they have gotten a golden ticket. One of our coaches uh, said, hey, sometimes I, I go to these areas, maybe it's the Bronx, maybe it's Chicago, maybe it's LA, maybe it's uh, Atlanta, Georgia, um, maybe it's Dorchester, Mass, and I've got one golden ticket to give. Uh, I mean, and we're resourced, uh, but I would love to be able to give more golden tickets or have every single kid feel like they've gotten a golden ticket. And it doesn't necessarily mean need blind. That's, you know, $500 million, but um, we do fundraise, right? And we are asking people to make Proctor their philanthropic priority. Uh, we want people who can help us vision. We, we think we have the best model of education that, um, of anybody. Um, and we certainly think we have the best model of education that that we can create for ourselves. So if, we com if we're comparing ourselves to ourselves, we want people to support that. And we want to have the kids here, um, sort of regardless of ability to, ability to pay, to be here. Uh, and that's not always possible. Hmm. Don't know if, I don't know if Brian as a 14 year old would have had the resources to um to be here right right um do you feel like do you do you think that a lot of students that most students at proctor feel that sense of appreciation that that i like the golden ticket sort of metaphor right even do. it doesn't mean you can eat all the chocolate you want it just means that you feel like you've you've got something really special right 
I, you know, kids are, are here. Some, some of our kids are here because look, they've had their height, their sights set on this from the time their brothers or sisters were here or from the time they were in fourth, fifth grade, going to Proctor, that's where I'm going. And some people are, they take the tour and they're deciding between two or three or six different other schools and they get here and they love it, but then they're in fringe groups or whatever. I, I sort of feel like our kids are normal teenagers. And I think the longer they, they're here, the more they really get it and understand. Um, but I mean, I, I don't wanna sell people something that doesn't really exist, but I do think that our, our kids are really happy. I do think that they're pretty kind to each other, kinder than any other place that I've seen. I would love to see more representation of the world here, right? Um, there, there are communities that aren't represented fully, I would say, at the, at the school. That's, that is one of the reasons why I'm, that I'm here. Um, there are no kids from Harvey, Illinois. Not, not that that's a, a standard that anybody would like to, to necessarily live up to, but I would love to have our kids, when we're together, you know, and we're coming from all of these different places around the world, maybe in the Northeast, which is mainly when a lot of folks do come from, but different parts of the world. When we're together uh, as a community, uh, we're not just better, but kids are more relevant, right? Because they're, they, be, they get to be more comfortable in their own skin when they can go to a friend's house who did not grow up like them did not have the same circumstances uh, that, that they themselves have come from. And um, I think that is the, the most important thing about, uh, about inclusion and belonging and diversity work. But more than that, we want them to be uh, not just culturally aware, not just culturally responsive, but um, uh, adaptive. We really want them to be able to go into any sort of um, you know, community or like church, synagogue, mosque, whatever, and feel completely who they are as people, right? Um, because you don't always feel that. And it doesn't, in it, you know, people are trying to take away, like, I don't want my kid to be uncomfortable. Well, you know, <laughs> that, yeah, that would be great if we could just make every single kid comfortable as they're going through the learning process. But part of it is making them relevant in the world, right? Yeah. So speaking of being uncomfortable, uh, <laughs> this is this is kind of a personal question um, yeah. from from somebody just put it out there said you know, as parents, we're sitting here and we, we, we're thinking that we'd love to give our child this gift of boarding school, maybe maybe boarding school, maybe just Proctor, I don't know. Um, but their child is torn, right? Like, oh my God, I, 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 I'm leaving the known. This is such an unknown. Uh, can, I, can I do this? Do you twist arms? What do you do? What are your thoughts as a parent, Brian? What's your... Huh, that's a good question. I believe um, that it's important that you see it in action as best you can, if you haven't already. Um, I don't think you twist arms. I don't think you say, I know what's best at this, at this point. I mean, you, many of you know your own kids, but um, I don't necessarily think either that you um, that you leave it completely up to your kid. I think it is a conversation with them. Um, and, I, and I do think what you do is you have a really clear sense of what your own values are and your own intentions for, your, for yourself, but also for your kid. And then match it up with and show them with what you think the values are. And I think they're clear and intentions of our school, right? That's that's how you get to the like, wow, this matches. I mean, it's not gonna hit hit on every single thing, right? But 
you know, if there are things that, that we do and we do well, best in class, right? Then really look at the values and how the values match up. Um, I'm, we're not really interested in having kids be here who don't really want to be here. I'm very, I, I think very few kids, um, like no kids really, <laughs> don't want to be here. I think every kid does have sort of like, oh, I wish it was home. Uh, I haven't seen a whole lot of homesickness uh, here. That, that was something that I thought I would see more of. I, I don't see that. But when things aren't right at any school, in any place, it's usually a values thing, right? That the values and or intentions don't match up, right? And that's the, that's the work that parents have to do. And that's the conversation that you have with your kid is like, wow, that you seem, we as a family, this is what we value. Here's sort of what we intend, not that you become like a lawyer or a doctor or, but we value learning, but we value learning more about um, how you learn. That's Proctor, right? We really love that you, you have a teacher that pushes you and wants the best of you, but really sees where you are and understands where you are. That's Proctor. Right, just go down the list of what you what excellence looks like to us. What it it looks like to me is that um, this is an intention: is that we get one day better every day. That we're not going to get ten days better overnight, or that we're expecting kids to. That's 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 a value. That's an intention that we that we hold. Um, I remember. I mean, so to tell you the corollary to that is is this is is. There was a parent, uh, not at the school, who came in and said, um, you know, we said we, um, and it's the same way at Proctor, we think that the college journey is one of self-discovery. And, um, and we really do want the kid to drive that because it's important that they do at that age. And the parent said, I can't allow that. <laughs> like my, like it's, college is way too important. And I said, you would be unhappy. You would be unhappy here, um, and that person didn't come. Euphemistically means that they didn't get in, but uh, <laughs> it just meant that you may share or hold that for your child, but that's not a value of ours, right? It is a journey of self-discovery, and certainly parents have input. You are going to be paying the bill, right? Uh, mostly. Um, but they have to discover who they are in the process and what they want, and what they don't want. They have to understand and surface their intentions and the things that they care about deeply. So that's what we're after. We really are after kids who are diving down deeply into surfacing uh, the things that, that matter to them. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, it's, it's like, getting students to understand that. I mean, that's not something that, that you can just sort of explain to them. It's a process that sort of happens yeah. right through engagement with adults and through these, these authentic kind of learning experiences. Then yeah. that's how they learn to reflect and understand what their own intentions are. Right? They may not even want to go right on to school, which in this day and age, like if you're doing pandemic sort of studying why, why why would you do that yeah um shifting gears slightly um you you mentioned you know that you are the fourth head of school in 50 odd years uh and so the the contextual question is um what do you think you want to do differently than previous leaders? What do you, do you, you want to hold on to certain traditions for lack of a better word? Um, you know, I think people are interested to know, like, are, are you going to, are you going to shake things up? Or are you going to um, surface your intentions with us, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I like the Blues Brothers. That movie was shot in my hometown, right? Um, 
I'm, I'm not on a mission from God. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I am. I think the, <laughs> um, it, it's interesting. The, the person who really I've, I've spent a bunch of time with is David Fowler. David's in his 80s right now. He, was, he became head of school. He started working here in 1964. He was your head of school, Chris. Um, he was head from 1971 to 1996. Is that right? 95, 96? 95. Uh, yeah, so um, he pressed hard reset on the school. Like it became, it was, you know, we went from a boys boarding school, tie coat, blah, 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 traditional to what he said was the anti boarding school, right? First name basis, casual, more casual dress, uh, more of an outdoor experiential emphasis. Um, and I said to, David, how did you get there? What did you What did you do to shake things up? I mean, it sort of feels like well, a lot of schools have caught up to us. They're all this school, that school, that they do this, they do that. Um, and I just asked him, like, what did you do? Like, how did you do that? And he said, I just um, facilitate it. And for me, that's like, you know, that sports analogy. Forgive me. It's like being a point guard, right? And you've got vision, and you're passing to people who are really good at finishing, right? Um, there are really good people that work here. Um, smart people, smarter than me people, <laughs> right? Um, like you, Chris. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think the thing that, um, that I would like to do differently is to do it in this modern context, right? We, we're, we're facing, I think, builders, right? Facilitator builders. I, I think we've got a lot of stuff to do as a as a culture and i'm not going to put it on on the backs of the proctor kids but we need to build bridges um we need to build a sense of like connection to self and sanity um i think we need to you know build and stretch into to areas that will solve these massive issues like climate change um I, you know i think when I think of my impact, when somebody, if I were here for 25 years, uh, I'd be about 109 then, by the way. <laughs> um, but if I were here for, for as long as, uh, as uh, David Fowler were here, I would want us, I would want people to say, oh, that's the Proctor model or the Proctor magic. That's what we, we call it around here, where kids are mostly out in the world doing stuff, solving stuff, that teachers are coaching kids to do those things, teaching them discreetly what they need to know. Um, but they're out in the world and they're, 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 they're learning what they need to know to be relevant in the world, but they're out there solving big problems. Um, and they're, they're understanding that, that they can't do it alone, that they have to do it collaboratively in groups with coaching, um, with a clear idea of, of who they are and who they aren't uh, in the world. That's, that's sort of my, my, my thinking. And if that's replicated in you know, two other schools in the, the world or in the nation, not that it would be on our dime because I'm not really interested in replicating our model, but I am interested in teaching what it is that we do well. And we do a lot of stuff well. That's my vision. It's a great vision. Um, what do you think, uh, back to the here and now, what do you think kids really love about Proctor? And what do you think parents love about Proctor? What have you, what have you heard? Oh. What are people telling you? Hmm. Hmm. I think, well, it's interesting. I think kids love the fact that that there kind of is a level playing field for everybody that they they don't have to come in pretending or posturing or being anybody else um it's hard because the the you know at this age especially middle school early early high school you know your friend group matters so so much right um but people feel like they can drop a lot of the pretense 
that they have to prove it to somebody else. There's a there's a young woman here who was um, at a former school, not when I was there, um, in the Bay Area, and, and many of the schools that she tried didn't quite work. Her learning was a little different. Her her brain was wired a little differently. And being here, talk, talking to her parents, um, they just said, "Like I just have my kid back." Like it was like, it was like having my sixth grader back who would like crawl into my arms, but she's bigger than that now. So she can't really do that. Um, and, and when people say like, I get my kid back, um, like the best of my kid back after a really hard time and maybe in middle school or even a good time, like I have my, my, th this kid that I, knew was there all along. And people sometimes feel like they lose their kid in the teenage, teening process. <laughs> um, I don't see a lot of that. Um, and for those kids who have come to us after programs that have, that's been hard, maybe not contextually right for them, um, we ask them like, what is it, what is it that you want? Uh, and that's a, that's a big question. What works for you? So um, I think for kids, they, they get to be their authentic selves, right? And for parents, they get the kid that they like, I knew you were there all along. <laughs> like, it was you. They were just taken hostage for a couple of years. They were taken alien, hostage. Right? I remember having that, that same discussion with my own kid in, in high school. She was going to my high school. And she was like, she told people literally, um, somebody said, so where are you coming from? We went from the North Bay to the East Bay. You know, well, I live in, I don't know, Marin County. Like, how do you get here? Like, that's like 40 minutes away. My dad works in town. Literally, I was in the window over from where they were talking outside. Like, she wanted nothing to do with me or the school. And I've realized that's a dad thing. Um, but, but it's hard, right? really being your own self in your own school is hard. Um, and what we try to do is not make it easier, but we try to just say, it's okay to be yourself. Um, so Brian, we've got like, we, we, wanna, we wanna end on time, right? Do no we, such thing as a, a really Zoom. Good. Yeah, I get you, yeah. I no know. such thing as a Zoom call that goes over, over time. That's no. Fun, right? No. Just gotta go right to that line. So we got uh, just a couple more questions. Um, yes, sir. But uh, do, is there anything else you want to add uh, before I ask you a couple, couple more zingers? No, I mean you know, I I think the the idea about um, you know your lives will go through things and like okay my kid's not going to be there for these this essential thing grandma's birthday or whatever. Um, we just got off a bonus weekend and. Four or five days. Sometimes kids flew across the country to be with their their families. Sometimes they went home with uh, uh, other families, other friends. Um, that hard reset right now was after being on for four weeks was magic. And um, you know, just I was talking to I don't know Hayes and Cassidy. I was at a table. Hayes, Cassidy, uh, Ali. Uh, girl hockey players basically tonight and um they were just saying how restored they felt I, I went to the faculty they felt the same way like I just felt I just feel like myself now uh you get to dive down really deeply into something and then like poof you know men in black kind of like um memories sort of restored I like that the 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 regular metronomic breaks in our time um, Ryan, like fun fact, uh, yep. is it true that you just tried to skiing for the first time? Last oh yeah. Week? All right. Fun fact, I did, uh, Nordic skiing. I did not go down a hill yet. Nobody pushed me. Okay. Uh, and it was hard. Nordic ski is not easy, right? Yeah. Getting that, it was the classic, right? Yep. That thing. Uh, it's not like being on the elliptical, which I thought it was going to be like, it's not that at all. Uh, we have some really good Nordic skiing. Gears, Ada. I don't know Ada. Um, she's one of the better ones in the in the Northeast. Um, mom's the librarian here. Um, uh, her mom was the one who actually brought me out and, and 
found boots for me that were 78s. I didn't, who knew my feet were that big or 48s? I can't remember what, <laughs> sizes. Um, <laughs> they were massive boots, but not as big as my 13s usually. But um, that was kind of cool. It's yeah. really neat. Trying new things. Yeah, I, I would say, Brian, like, uh, I, I definitely would give you a shout out. I mean, I think like anytime anybody on campus says to Brian, like, hey, Brian, try this. He's like, okay, I'll try that. Mikey, I'm Mikey from the Life Serial. That really yeah. dated myself. Yes, uh, I, I did this sort of Shonda Rhimes say yes to everything, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that, that uh, Shonda Rhimes, of course, the, the queen of TV. Uh, but she just had this year of yes. And you, that's the Proctor thing. Like, yeah, of course. Be in a play? Sure. Yeah. What's next? What are, what are you going to say yes to? Do you know? Uh, it, well, it's, it's the downhill thing, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, pond hockey. Yep. That's coming up. Yeah. Pond hockey. Um, I, did the, I, I did do wilderness orientation. That was pretty fun. Every new kid goes through that five days out in the wilderness. And it's not like tent camping. It's tarp camp camping. <laughs> okay. okay. We won't we'll say right much now. about it, but it was pretty rigorous. It was very Knowles-like, right? <laughs> it was very designed by Knowles people for Knowles people, really. Um, and the kids were very kind to me. And and it rained a lot, but it's not it going to rain this. It's not going to rain in the fall of 22, folks. No, no. We, just, we know that. We've looked at the long-term forecast. And the right. Guys are going to be sunny next September. You have to get, uh, kids are really comfortable in the elements here. That is something too that's kind of different than, than I'm used to. They're not indoors kids like my brother and me, right? <laughs> Indoorsmen. Um, so. <laughs> we, we've got a lot of elements here too. Especially yeah. Yeah. yeah, black fly season. I can't wait. Yeah, that's a that's a, <laughs> that's a classic. <laughs> anyway, we want these people to come here, Brian. So let's not talk. Okay, about okay. Them, right? <laughs> um, um, yeah, cool. It is very, it's very Thoreauian, like uh, Henry David Thoreau. There is something about being in this place that does remind you of sort of those New England roots. Um, like if you ever went to Concord Mass, if you've ever gone to Concord Mass, there's a there's a little bitty graveyard like the the Poets Hill there. Um, there is something um, amazingly familiar about it. In some ways, that's what I find. Um, something um, inspiring, really, about being in a small New England town, white clebbered. Um, you know, you won't find sort of the modern the, you know, Mies van der Rohe building in the middle of campus, right? Um, there's something just really familiar about it, right? And, and there's something very intentional about the, about what we do. And that's amazing. Yeah, That's really amazing. Um, well, Brian, thank you so much for, for your time. And to all of you out there, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, And folks. getting to know uh, Proctor and Brian and our community even more. Um, we're super excited about this admission process. Um, news, more news and information to come over the coming weeks, but uh, campus will be uh, opening back up for uh, accepted student days in the spring. Um, so we're definitely looking forward to more engagement. If you have questions between now and March 10th, just reach out to anybody uh, on our team in the admission office and we look forward to being in touch. Again, thanks for tuning in and have a great night.